Hello everyone, Hello. welcome to the MIT Category Seminar. So today we have with us Todd Frimble from the Western Connecticut State University. He's gonna talk about uh, regular relational calculus, so uh, calculus of relations from a geometrical perspective. Uh, so I already give the word to him. I hope, uh, okay, maybe let's first see if uh, everybody can hear Everybody can hear. Wonderful. Okay, uh, so uh, Todd, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, very good. So yeah, uh, stage is yours. Um, so I'm Todd Trimble. If I haven't met you before, uh, now you know what I look like. So I'll be speaking, as Paolo said, on the geometry of regular relational calculus. And this actually has, in my opinion, quite a long history, beginning with a mathematician from the 19th century named uh, Charles Sanders Peirce and his development of logic using certain diagrams which are strangely suggestive of the kinds of diagrammatic tools that we use today like string diagrams. So, um, so Peirce uh, was very interested in developing logic. I think he and Frege were some of the ones who really spearheaded the modern development of logic. Uh, Peirce's point of view was to look at relations as being sort of the most interesting things. So there's a point of view that you can look at predicates on items, um, which is sort of a one-way street, but relations are sort of a two-way street. So you know, with, the, with the verb love, you know, so that's the relation between um, uh, two sets of people, say, you know, men and women, men, certain man loves a certain woman. So relations are sort of two-way or three-way streets. And it was first who realized that you can take relations and put them together in certain ways. So it's uh, very much along the lines of um, the way he thought of it is very much along the lines of atoms combining in, in chemical bonding schemes to form molecules. So, I mean, he really had this idea that uh, language and linguistic constructions are highly analogous to bonds in, in, chem in chemistry. And I mean, he also noticed that, um, that the way that one thinks of composing relations is extremely similar to uh, the way that one thinks of composing matrices, for example. So if you have two relations, R from a set A to a set B, and another one S from a set B to a set C, then you can compose them in a familiar way. Um, you're looking to see whether there's a path going from element A to an element C, which passes through some element of B, which is uh, indicated in that existential formula. But that's analogous, as he clearly realized, to uh, the way that one forms products of matrices. So there's a clear formal analogy between these. And uh, here, what I've drawn below here is uh, a little picture that, that Peirce would have enjoyed in, in which uh, you're sticking together two relations R and S and forming a kind of chemical bond. So this is um, the kind of some pictures that he would draw. And it's very similar to these sorts of pictures that we draw when we make string diagrams to consider compositionality questions. Um, you know, think of it this way, and this is over a hundred years ago when he was you know, introducing what are really very modern ideas. And in fact, let me see, uh, I read just the other day a quote from him. He says, a chemical atom is quite like a relative uh, and having a number of loose ends or unsaturated bonds. And then he speaks in this somewhat cryptic way about blanks the relative. But there's a very clear analogy with relational calculus. So these, these loose ends that he's referring to in this quote, uh, I would think of those as being strings in an open network, such as the sorts of networks that Baez and his school are interested in these days. So loose ends are like open strings. Uh, he refers to blanks of the relative, but those blanks are like placeholders. That's how we think of uh, relational variables. Chemical valence is like the arity of the relation. And uh, again, just to reinforce, um, we had this notion of uh, an, an analogy between putting together relations and chemical bonding it's interesting that the word bonding uh, is used in these two 
disparate senses uh, in, in chemistry, but we also speak of bound variables when we apply existential quantification. Development there. And so, I mean, he really wanted to display clearly to himself uh, the, the pictures in which to represent relations and their composition. And he developed something which he called existential graphs, of which he was very proud. Uh, he would call it my chef d'oeuvre uh, to represent these logical deductions that he was developing. And as I say, I mean, he and Frege. Uh, were pretty much contemporaneous, working quite independently with each other, but it was really Peirce who uh, emphasized strongly the fact that relations enjoy this compositional algebra. And so, yeah, existential graphs. I mean, he kind of thought of this in layers. Uh, the most elementary portion was looking at simple propositions. Um, so this is sort of like Boolean algebra, let's say. Um, so this is just propositional, propositional logic. Uh, the best developed system was what he called beta in which he really worked out a full-fledged calculus for first order logic based on relations. Uh, this uses uh, all these logical operations, the, the and, the true exists, uh, Negation here, this is my simple thing, negation and the following. And then he had something far off in the future that never got quite completely developed, but he spoke about gamma. I was going to say something about this, but I decided I don't have enough time to get through the entire talk. So uh, this is a little bit gratuitous, I would say, but a lot of people have taken his ideas and thought that I mean, he was developing modal logic uh, I think some people have missed, maybe missed a boat. I think maybe he was trying to develop higher order logic, but that thread doesn't seem to have been taken up so much. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna leave it cryptically at that. Uh, if you'd like to ask me more about what I'm talking about, then I can uh, join a chat somewhere, but uh, I'm gonna pass on. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is look at a uh, stripped down version of beta I strip down, I'm not going to look at the full logical power of first order logic, but I'm going to take away negation and just concentrate on that fragment of logic that you have just with the logical operations um, conjunction, true, there exists, and equal. But uh, I'm going to take a system beta, but really try to modernize it and connect it up with topology. Okay. So uh, I'm going to jump about 100 years later after Peirce. Um, I'm going to be re referring to some work by Carboni and Walters uh, that goes uh, was in a paper called was in a paper called Cartesian by Categories One. So this is a very modern, uh, updated categorical way of formulating the relational calculus. Uh, it's very slick, um, too categorical. Uh, I think maybe I should back into it a little bit by describing some of the insights that, that, that enter into the, the very sort of slick definition that you can give for these things. So yeah, I will just focus on a very classical case for looking, we'll be considering the bicategory relations. So as you may very well know, a bicategory or two category is a two dimensional categorical structure uh, with zero cells or objects, which in this case are sets, and morphisms, in this case will be relations between sets. And then um, for any two relations going from the same set A to the same set B, you can ask whether one relation is uh, a subset or is included in the other, and those play the role of two cells. So two cells would be in inclusions, and of course you can compose inclusions when you get a sort of two-dimensional structure. But uh, the bicategory relations has some very special features, and I want to point out some of the, the key facts here. So, I mean, one really beautiful fact, I, I love this, uh, one really beautiful fact is that you can pluck out functions from the bicategory of all relations in a very slick categorical way. It turns out that when you 
consider which of the one cells or morphisms are left, left adjoints in this bicategorical structure. They are the same as functions. So functions are left adjoints internal to the bicategory. Well, uh, I should explain a little bit. So uh, when you're talking about a left or right adjoint or an adjunction, then you have a, a co-unit. Uh, the co-unit uh, would go from a composite where you start with the right adjoint. In this case, it'll be the opposite relation and follow with the left adjoint, which in this case is the original relation, and you map to the identity. And that's the co-unit. Now the identity in the bicategory of relations, if you're looking at an identity arrow between two objects, uh, that's really just the equality relation. That, that is what plays the role of the identity when you compose relations. So when you study what it means to have a co-unit, you're saying that you would have an inclusion between the left side here and the identity relation. It would say that if x is related to y prime, and if x is related to y, I'm reading it backwards in the opposite relation, but if x is related to y and x is related to y prime, then y and y prime are equal. That says that the relation is a well-defined function. And then you have a unit, which says that if x equals x prime, then there exists a y um, such that x comma y belongs to the relation that says that the relation is defined for all inputs x. And so you immediately retrieve the uh, notion of function as a root in a junction in this way. Some terminology here, we call it a left adjoint in rel. This is what Carboni and Malthus call. They call it a map. So uh, in other words, a map should be thought of as a function and the, the uh, you can look inside the bicategory bi like rel and ask what are the objects and the maps, which are the internal left adjoints and the two cells between them. And in this case, we're just giving sets and functions. So that's the first nice fact that they frequently invoke. Uh, the other, another thing that comes up is uh, something that you learn when you're first learning about category theory and the fact that you can describe products uh, in terms of universal properties, and maybe in the slickest way uh, to think of it is that um, you describe the product functor, which takes a pair of sets of the product, as being a right adjoint to a diagonal functor. And uh, correspondingly, you can think of a terminal object, which is like an empty product, as being right adjoint to the unique functor. So maybe this is just a very slick way of describing universal properties of products. Just to remind you of some things here, so if I'm just referring to an adjunction here, the unit of the adjunction is just the ordinary diagonal knot here. And the co-unit, well, what does the co-unit do? Uh, yeah, so it would, what is the left adjoint here? It's delta. So when you first apply the right adjoint, that means take the product and then uh, apply delta, you get a, a pair of maps, uh, a cross b comma a cross b, mapping to the identity on the pair a b. And so what the co-unit gives you is a pair of maps from a cross b uh, to a, and from a cross b to b, and those are just projection maps. So the projection maps gives you some uh, But one thing I should say here is that, yeah, um, that's, that's the situation in set, but now we're going to be regarding this product structure, diagonal maps and projection maps and so on, as living up in the bi-category relations. So in the first place, I mean, there is this idea that you can take the product of two relations, okay? One thing I should mention right away is that this product of relations, which is formed in the usual way, uh, is not a product in the categorical sense of having a universal property. That is to say that the product in set is not the product as well. It's, it's something else. Um, related to this is the fact that the diagonal map, the projection map, 
this, this epsilon here. Um, yeah, they also lift up to rel, but they're not natural in the strict sense, uh, in having an equation, a naturality equation, but rather there's an inclusion, um, which is what Lax is referring to here. So we have, um, we laxify the usual naturality conditions, and I've written out what, what uh, form that laxity would take. But maybe I should continue on here. So let me uh, explain a little bit about what it means that the diagonal delta is going to be a lax natural transformation. So it means that for any relation R, you have an inclusion of this form. And what I've done below here is I've spelled out uh, what this inclusion would mean. Uh, the left-hand side, delta C following R, uh, you write it out in terms just following your nose and writing up a logical formula, you get a, a semi-complicated looking logical formula, but it turns out to be something very simple. And I've written out the right-hand side, also semi-complicated. So when you boil it all down, um, what the laxity is saying is that if R relates A to C prime, and if C prime happens to be equal to C double prime, then by the principle of the fact that you can substitute equals for equals, you can infer um, that A is related to C double prime, if, if A is already, already related to C prime over here. So this implies this. Uh, the right-hand side forgets the fact that C prime equals C double prime, but you can infer this anyway. And that's what the laxity comes down to. And I make a little sort of throwaway comment here is that the, the converse of this implication would say that the relation is well defined. And then there's the lax inclusion for um, epsilon. In case it's not clear, epsilon was, let me go back a little bit. Epsilon. I'm not sure I wrote it down. Yeah, epsilon was a co unit for this terminal object here, the terminal object is right adjoint the unique functor. So you get a, a unit for that adjunction. In any case, um, there's another lax inclusion, uh, but spelling it out, this epsilon, what it is, is the function that, that takes, um, uh, that goes from any given object A to the what will be the terminal inside the by category of mass. So I mean, the, the point is, is that this is the maximal relation uh, between A and the terminal set. And the laxity would just translate to saying that this, uh, this relation on A implies the maximal relation. That says that any A is equal to a C. So with all that, um, I can give you a definition of Cartesian bicategory, which is uh, not quite the way that Carboni, Carboni Walters put it. Um, I believe this way of phrasing things is due to me. I've not seen it written down by anybody else, but um, but just I'll just say that it follows pretty directly the development that I've given so far. A Cartesian bicategory is a bicategory which is locally ordered, um, meaning that um, it, it's like in the case of re ordinary relations. You have inclusions, but there's only one way of including one relation side of the other. So there's only one two cell going between any two one cells. In other words, you get a, a post set at the local POM category level. So it's locally ordered at least as far as Carboni and Walters were concerned back in 1987. Uh, the Cartesian body category should come equipped with uh, functors or rather two functors, um, which we're calling tensor. That, that's like the Cartesian product uh, of relations. And we have this I, which plays the role of a terminal, at least with regard to the maps. And then you have, um, things that play the role of a what would be a unit of an adjunction between tensor and delta, and what would be a co-unit between 
again, delta and the tensor. And a, a similar, I, I said co-unit before, I meant to say unit. But these are only lax, as I was saying before. These, they're not strict natural transformations, but they're only lax. But you do have the usual triangular identities that, that would hold. So um, I've just written those out here. I take it that anybody who is uh, a big fan of category theory and who has studied junctions has, has seen these triangle equations. It's the same thing going on here. This is the full definition. This is full stop. Uh, it's all about one set. But you get everything. Uh, so, I mean, one thing I should say here, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that when we restrict this data, like the, the delta here, the diagonal, and the projections, when you restrict to the maps inside of B, you should get not something lax natural, but you should get something strictly natural. And if, if so, then, then the bicategory of sets or objects and, and maps would acquire Cartesian products from the setup. And that's the point of this lemma right here. So this is a quick two categorical lemma. Um, you can just take it as it is, but if you have a nat lax natural transformation between um, two functors, F and G, then when you apply that lax transformation to a uh, left adjoint, uh, you will get an isomorphism. So let me explain a little bit. So we have these uh, lax, right? So we have these sort of lax two cells right here. But I'm saying if if R here happened to be a map, then this would turn out to be an actual isomorphism, this two cell. So that's that's what's actually going on right now. Right here. And it's a proof. I mean, it's simple enough. Um, if you have a a one cell in your bi category, which has a right adjoint, uh, you can produce an inverse to the lax two cell, which would look like this. And the way it works is um, in sort of Australian talk, you would take the, the mate of the lax two cell that you would have for the right adjoint. So I'm gonna skip right over to here and point out that the lax two cell for the right adjoint would be an inclusion from delta C composed with F star to F star plus F star to delta. And that's the lax two cell. And then you do a little song and dance and you uh, convert that to the, in, the inverse that you want over here. So the way it works is this. You, you start off with this thing that you want to be the domain of your inverse and you map over using the unit of the, the map F, you would map over for this expression here. Then you apply your lax two cell here, and then you apply the co-unit for F cross F, left adjoint to F star cross F star, and that will collapse that down to the identity and you're left simply with delta F. And that's how you invert that lax two cell. Pretty easy. So yeah, as I say, um, that means that the lax transformations delta and diagonal and the projection and this sort of projection down to the terminal, they're all strict natural on the bicategory maps and therefore the bicategory maps acquires finite products in this way. Uh, yeah, um, so as I say, this is a very different definition than given by Carboni Walters. Uh, they set things up in a rather different way by saying that the, you start off with a bicategory and you assume that it has symmetric monoidal bicategory structure. But really, all this comes out of the wash because uh, the, the maps have now acquired uh, the product structure, which gives you the symmetric monoidal structure on the ambient uh, bicategory. And moreover, again, if you're following the development of Carboni Walters, they're remarking that every object is a cohomonoid um, whose co-multiplication lives inside the bicategory of maps. Well, what is that co-multiplication? That's just the diagonal map going from A to A tensor A. 
and then you have uh, the laxity of these various transformations that translates to the saying that general relations or one cells are going to be co-lax morphisms of co-monoids. You can recreate the whole development of Cardoni Walters uh, just from the definition of the game. Right. So I mean this what this very nice bicategorical definition gives is um, a way of encapsulating a lot of examples that people have in mind when you speak of relational calculus. So for example, if C is a regular category, you can form the bicategory of relations. Um, that works just like as, as in set. Um, the idea is that um, a relation from uh, an object A to an object A will be a sub-object of A plus. Uh, you have a relation from, I'll start again. A relation from A to B in a regular category C is a sub-object of A cross B. So you set up relations in the same way. If you don't know what a regular category is, I would not worry about it. Um, it's a, a nice category in which certain expected properties of uh, existential quantification and conjunctions work harmoniously together. And in any, any case, it's tailor-made so that you actually do get a, a bicategory. And moreover, if uh, C is a regular category, you can get a nice fact that you can retrieve the original regular category by taking maps on its by relations. In particular, uh, the, the, a common context for regular categories where they often can come from is by taking category, category of algebra or some monad on set. That's a very typical place where they arise. Uh, I'm going to give a very different example now of a Cartesian by category by referring to what are called modules over post sets or over pre orders. And um, this is really, a, I'm speaking in Australian right now. Um, modules are also called profunctors. And so if you have uh, post sets, you can think of um, these as categories, spin categories. And a module would mean um, a relation inside this Cartesian product uh, that, so that P uh, acts on the relation. So if you have an element, um, if you're, yeah, if for example, uh, P comma Q is true in the relation and P prime is less than P, then P prime um, comma Q belongs to the relation as well. So you're kind of pulling back along this uh, a morphism going from P prime to P. So you have an action of the post set P on this relation, and similarly you have an action of the post set Q on the relation. And you get what are called modules. Well, these modules form a Cartesian by category. But they're a little bit different in character. You don't get, um, well, it's not like this, the, the maps here, let me, let me think a minute. Well, the, the, actually, yeah, it's okay. The, the, the maps for this particular Cartesian bicategory brings you back to the category, the bicategory of post sets. So getting just a category, but I'm bicategory. Okay. Right, but with that last example, I just spoke about modules. And um, yeah, uh, really the examples that Carboni and Walters would have loved to develop in their own 1987 paper um, would it have included not just uh, ordinary vanilla bicategories relations in a regular category, but they would include other bicategories which behave in a very rel like way. So as many of you may know, uh, the bicategory of spans uh, behaves in a way which is very similar to the bicategory of relations. Um, you can compose them and then you can ask questions like what are the maps, um, the left adjoints of the bicategory span, and they just count the functions again between sets. Or you can generalize this in the case where C is a finitely complete category and talk about spans in C. And again, you get a similar statement that the maps bring you right back to C again. 
But then there are other uh, jazzier examples, like looking at modules uh, in the same sense as before, but now instead of letting posets act, you let um, categories act. So these are actually just the same thing as cofunctors. In other words, a module from C to D, if C and D are categories, is just a cofunctor from C to D. So this is also, morally speaking, this is also a Cartesian bicategory in spirit, but um, this kind of, the, all these examples here, they're not locally ordered. So they kind of fall a little bit outside the ambit of the carboni walters definition, which is a, a simplified setting. Uh, by imposing local orders on the bi-category, uh, you simplify many, many things. Now, at the time, uh, this is 1987, it was not really that clear what was even meant by a symmetric monodal bicategory. Uh, nobody had actually written out the full-fledged definition. And so in 87, the technical details were thought to be you know, quite overwhelming to actually give a full-fledged development which would take these examples into consideration. Uh, this was finally rectified in 2007. There's a four-author paper, Carboni, Kelly, Walters and Wood, um, who actually gave the nice definition, which would actually capture all these examples here. Uh, yeah, I make a little remark here that in these jazzier examples, the bicategory of maps will not have just plain old categorical products, but rather two products. Similar. And so, yeah, this is uh, this notion of what a Cartesian bicategory really is, is due to these four authors here. And yeah, um, it goes very much like what I presented before. Again, this is not their definition. This is uh, what I came up with. So it'll follow very similar lines. We drop the locally ordered condition. Uh, we say that the bicategory comes equipped with a tensor product. Uh, which at the level of maps will be a right adjoint to a diagonal map. So again, you have these lax natural transformations, delta uh, for the diagonal and the projections and the projection down to the, what would be the terminal in maps B. All of these things have components um, in maps of B. In other words, these, these have, um, when you evaluate this as an, at an object A, you get a left adjoint inside the by category. But I need to be a little bit trickier about things. Um, the tensor product will not be right adjoint to the diagonal at the level of maps, but it'll be a um, right adjoint in the two categorical sets. So you will have a, a two categorical adjunction between tensor and delta at the level of maps. So what happens is that when you would sit down and analyze what you mean by a two categorical adjunction, you get something which is not the triangle equations that you're familiar with, but the equations have to be replaced by uh, an isomorphism at the two cell level. So you have these, what are called triangular triangulators to use a coinage, I think is due to Baez. Um, these triangulators, which would give you the two adjunction between tensor and delta. There's things coming up. And then when you sit down and analyze uh, really what it means to have a two adjunction, a two categorical adjunction, there are further coherence conditions which must be imposed, which I don't expect anybody but an expert to follow, but I'm gonna flip to it just to show you what it looks like. So these triangular, triangulators must satisfy more coherence laws which in a paper by Baez, by Baez and Langford, which would be Langford, um, they call these coherence conditions swallowtail coherence laws, and they take this kind of pasting diagram form, which um, looks a little bit complicated. Um, and I guess in some sense it is, but this is what you would need to write down the elementary definition of two adjunction. Yeah, yeah, it's diagrams like these which really seem to speak to the fact that um, these 
pasting diagrams are sometimes awkward to work with, and maybe we should be using something like a string diagram technology to keep track of things. So display that on the next page. Yeah, these complications really are just begging for being expressed in terms of something like string diagrams. So what I've done here is I've written down a very kind of cute little picture of you know what the previous page was trying to say in pasting diagrams form. And it's very nice. You, you start off with a string diagram and you imagine a, a movie taking place going from left to right in which you introduce a little kink or a little S here. And then you change the, the height, you interchange the heights of these critical points here. So you kind of bring this one up and you bring this one down and, you, and then you can uh, unyank to get back to uh, the original thing again. And the condition was as if this full composite should just be the identity. That's a, you know, a much sort of nicer way in which to view the triangulator coherence condition, string diagrams. Don't you like my whiteboard here? Yeah, this is the whiteboard that I have in the back here. Uh, if I were really slick and knew how to use globular, I'd be doing all this up in globular. So there'll be time for that maybe one day. Yes, well, I mentioned the, the fact that you should really think of this as a movie going between string diagrams. So maybe you want to think of these, these moves as being assembled into something like a surface diagram. So making an illusion here that maybe we want to go up into a higher geometric dimension to capture the, the full flavor of what's going on here. But I'll start with string diagrams. So I expect many of you out there are familiar with string diagrams. I'll kind of breeze through this very quickly. Uh, right, so string diagrams are useful for calculating in monoidal categories. And so let's just imagine that we're in the case of rel, which is a symmetric monoidal category if you ignore the two cells. The monoidal unit would be indicated by just empty space. So you want to particularly notate it. Uh, tensor products will be indicated by left-right juxtaposition of the corresponding string diagrams. Uh, composition would be indicated by um, concatenation, where if uh, R follows S, then you place R below S. So And then you have, we want to incorporate now, since we're trying to describe Cartesian bicategories in string diagram form, we want to write down some appropriate string diagrams, which would capture the diagonal map. So we can see that right here. The projection map from A to the this monoidal unit I. You remember I is just empty space. So you have a string that kind of stops and uh, get a morphism from A to I. And then uh, these being left adjoints into by a category um, to write down the string diagrams for the right adjoints, which are indicated here. And you just flip these diagrams upside down. By the way, I mean, this data, the diagonal maps and this projection map here are considered so important that they need no introduction. So I'm not going to label the nodes here by delta particularly. Um, if I leave a node unlabeled, it's understood I am talking about delta. It's just, it's just considered that important. Uh, these play the role of equality relations, really. This is trying to say that a variable, variable here of the domain is equal to a variable here and a variable here. It's kind of duplicating the variable diagonal. Right, so putting these together, um, we can think about uh, how would we express the units and co-units of the adjunction. So I'm going to express them at least string diagrammatically by these kinds of just plain old vanilla rewrites. You just perform a kind of surgery where you break the string of equality in two, and now you're no longer asserting that this variable is equal to that variable. There's just that sort of empty space here that's separating them. So this, this, this rewrite represents this unit here. And the co-unit 
Well, you're mapping to the identity on empty space. So what it this kind of says that what is it what is it saying logically? It's saying that if there it's basically saying if there exists an element of A, then you conclude true. <laughs> but in any case, you can basically erase this and it's a valid view. And then you have um, a unit and co-unit for the diagonal map, which would take this form. So you can imagine the right-hand side, you kind of split this up. This is a composite of a top half and a bottom half indicated by my cursor here. So the bottom half would be the right adjoint delta star and the left, uh, the, uh, the upper half would be delta here. And so you're kind of saying, yeah, you can kind of prize apart the string to get these kind of bifurcating strings right here. And the co-unit would take this form. So this is, um, yeah, uh, what is this? This is delta star, which is the upper half here, followed by delta, this lower half. And again, you're kind of rising this apart to get two separate identities. Again, this is a much stronger condition. You're saying that you're sorting equalities between variables in each of these places. And now by rem uh, kind of surprising apart this string here, you get um, fewer equalities. Ah, um, and then we have these lax conditions, right? So the, these, uh, these things like um, the projection map down to the monoidal unit is uh, lax natural transformation. We want rewrites to express that. And so, yeah, what do you call these two cells? I picked up this funny word laxator, I think from David Spivak. It's sort of uh, the same noun formation as associator was introduced by Baez, I guess. Whenever you're introducing um, a structural constraint, you can sort of connote that by using this OR ending here. So laxator would be the, the two cell indicated here. So this represents sort of a lax natural transformation. But yeah, it says that, uh, what is this trying to say logically? It says that if there exists a B to which a variable A is R related, well, then you can include <laughs> that the variable A is equal to itself. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, there are these more laxators here. Let's see what we have here. The big screen. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, you kind of follow the string diagrams here. The left hand side is indicated here. So you've got these kinds of rewrites. You gotta be a little bit careful sometimes about the, the rewriting. So over here, yeah, it looks kind of simple. You kind of bifurcate the R's. But you just have to pay a little bit of attention to the typing discipline. So yeah, R is a relation from A to B cross C. So yeah, this is a lax constraint. This is the delta that you would form for B tensor C. This is the diagonal map you would use to take this string diagonal form. And so when you rewrite it according to the laxator rewrite, yeah, you don't get this kind of crossing anymore. You got to be a little bit careful, but the typing discipline keeps you in mind. Right. Yeah, so let's see, where am I in the thing? Yeah, I guess I'm doing okay on time. Yeah, so I've given you a more or less complete list of all the surgery or rewrite rules that you would need to generate the two cells of a free locally ordered Cartesian bicategory generated by a collection of relations which have, um, you know, given assigned types. So if you start off with a set of sorts S, you can form the free monoid of S, and a domain of a relation should be given by a list of sorts and the co domain by a list of sorts again. So this is a relational signature here. You can imagine building up um, by means of the string diagram calculus a representation of the Cartesian by category that you can generate from a relational signature like that. Yeah, and so uh, maybe about 20 years ago or so, uh, I did some work with a uh, historian of mathematics named Geraldine Brady, 
And um, we actually carried out this program for the full first order logic of, of, of um, Paris, actually, in terms of string diagrams. The drawback though, of string diagrams is that all these rewrite rules, they seem to destroy the topology that is taking place here. So, I mean, all these things, yeah. Um, I mean, you're kind of, you're really wrecking the topology in making these rewrite moves here. And so these rewrites tell me to me this a little bit unsatisfactory. They don't really respect the geometry of the topology that's happening, but you can make a little bit of progress on this. So instead of using string diagrams, uh, I had the idea quite some time ago to maybe thicken these string diagrams to make um, more uh, tubular looking diagrams in which the rewrites can now actually be viewed as certain types of cobordisms. So I'm going to give you some examples of what that looks like. Actually, let me just kind of flip ahead to this. So what I mean by thickening is you start off, for example, with a string diagram for the diagonal map, and you kind of you know, stretch in horizontal directions here, and you get a configuration that looks like this. And this is a two-dimensional thickening. And in the same way, the diagram for this so-called epsilon, the projection map, would you know, take on this form. I'm drawing it nice and smooth. So imagine that these are uh, two manifolds with boundaries like this. And then, you know, with that in mind, you can rewrite uh, the surgeries or the rewrites but now you can kind of think of this in, more, in a more cobordism-like way. So you can imagine taking this thickened strip representing the identity and then squeezing at the middle during a movie. So you can kind of squeeze in the middle and so at some point you get this kind of critical configuration, which will then kind of break apart sort of like a lava lamp from the 1960s or something. So you can imagine a cobordism which passes through this going from here to here. You can imagine the whole thing is being assembled into a movie, which now you know is a nice kind of smooth movie as a cobordism between these two. And similarly over here, if you're looking at the unit for the diagonal, then you can imagine a kind of a movie in which you might kind of take your finger and touch it right there, and then you kind of worm your finger around to create a little hole here and imagine a movie which will kind of uh, take this sort of nice solid sheet and then um, burrow out a hole here so you'd again assemble that into a cobordism from this guy to this guy well, that looks kind of attractive to me and just to emphasize that point i mean you could take a string diagram with a generic relation R uh, labeling one of the nodes. And you can imagine that you, you have now R, which is now being depicted. Instead of a node, you have a nice long segment here, followed by a diagonal map. And what you can kind of do in moving from this to the other side of a, of a laxator, is imagine a movie in which you kind of pull up this critical point until it just touches and you push it on through so you get this. And so again, you get this nice little movie which will take you from um, R followed by delta to delta followed by R tensor R. Okay. Oh, let me go down this one. These slides are so big that I I might miss some actual text here. So down at the bottom of here, yeah, I mean, this looks like a kind of an attractive system. Uh, the cobordisms, uh, yeah, it might replace the string diagrams, uh, and you might get a much nicer, from a topological point of view, much nicer way of thinking about these things. And maybe these cobordisms could be adapted to the fancier Cartesian bicategories too, which makes sense which involves not just locally ordered by categories, but the fancier ones involving lots of natural transformations 
you get something that um, is more proof relevant to use a phrase which is much in vogue these days. So I mean, that's an attractive dream that maybe these cobordisms could actually be used to study the free jazzed up Cartesian body categories generated by such and such. Uh, there's only one problem with using this particular picture, which to be honest is kind of a halfway house to what I really want to be doing. And the problem is, is that these planar thickenings don't quite do everything you want them to do because quite unfortunately, they're not too terribly well adapted to the fact that the co-multiplication, which is the uh, diagonal delta, the co-monoid co-multiplication is co-commutative and it seems to be really hard to capture this facet by using these thickened planar type pictures that I've just been indicating. So what I mean is, is that the co commutativity means that there is a, an invertible two cell from the diagonal map to diagonal map followed by a switch in here. So I've kind of indicated this diagonal map here followed by a switch or symmetry map, which we call C. And the fact of the matter is, is that you would like to assert that this composite here is equivalent to just plain old delta. But if you're using these types of planar diagrams, no matter how you try to undo this to make it look like a delta, you're going to introduce a little twist here, unfortunately. So really, I think the thing to do is just throw up your hands and, and admit defeat, or maybe not quite admit defeat. So maybe instead of using these planar thickenings that I've just been indicating, uh, you think into something else. So let's imagine that you take your string diagram and you immerse it in three-dimensional space, and you're looking at all the points which are at a fixed distance epsilon from the string diagram. And then the kind of a picture that emerges is something that's actually quite familiar to um, people, lots of people anyway, uh, who have studied cobordisms in the context of topological quantum field theories. So I'm talking about oriented two-dimensional cobordisms from a collection of circles to another collection of circles. So um, these are the types of cobordisms that are really the ones that I want to use. Um, and it, it really do the trick. So, um, so you can again start off by looking at the pair of pants, uh, as it is called, as a cobordism from one copy of S1 to two copies of S1 that plays a role delta, and then the cup, which goes from one copy to zero copies, and you can look at their adjoints by turning them upside down. But these are the cobordisms that really take care of this co competitivity issue that it's just raising. So, I mean, now that we're in cobordism land, um, I'm going to tease out another aspect of the structure of relational phi categories that we've been discussing. So let's just kind of bring us back. Um, you know, so now we're talking about the one cells will be represented by oriented two cobordisms between collections of circles. And the fact of the matter is, this is a bit of jargon here, but uh, it's well known in the lore on topological quantum field theories that uh, this prop, these morphisms are these oriented two cobordisms, contains what is called a Frobenius monoid. A Frobenius monoid that will be familiar to many of you in applied category theory land. It's a, um, this actually consists of a monoid and a co-monoid, which interact in a very kind of nice way, which I'm going to indicate in, in a minute. Um, yeah, but, but inside this prop, you see a generic commutative Frobenius monoid, also called a walking commutative Frobenius monoid. And as I'm saying, in, in relational calculus, these just pop up naturally in, in the canonical examples like relations, 
on a regular category or spans on a finally complete category. So yeah, going back to 1987, I mean, this notion uh, Boboni and Walters called discreteness uh, refers to um, a particular pair of maps that you can extract out of the co-associativity isomorphisms. Um, the, these maps that you can extract are actually mated in the sense of Australian category theory through these things. And let me just indicate how it goes. So you start off with this co-associativity and the inverse co-associativities. And we're going to extract two cells by a mating procedure and the Treatness axiom that, uh, that Carboni and Walters referred to is that these mate, mate, mates are actually invertible maps. Let me go straight to what these mates look like. So in terms of a string diagram presentation, you kind of apply a unit and then you apply a co-associativity between actually this layer here. So here to kind of flip this, this little strand right here over to the other side. And then you kind of prize apart these, this line here um, via a co-unit, as I've indicated before. And so what you get is uh, in co-bordism land, you get a uh, you, you sort of transforming one cobordism between a pair of circles here and a pair of circles here into another one. Damned if I didn't actually write out what that should look like. Nuts. <laughs> I make it to my slides. Uh, in any case, uh, I hope you can follow in your mind's eye how you deform sort of isotope this oriented cobordism over to this one. It's just a matter of sort of rearranging the critical points that would be, that would be corresponding to these points here. I'm sorry, I don't have the picture. Just to speak briefly about um, the Frobenius structure, the adjective discrete is a terrible word in my opinion. It doesn't it's only vaguely suggestive of, of what it means, but the word discreteness came from the fact that uh, if you impose this Frobenius condition about the invertibility going from here to here, if you impose that condition in the locally ordered case, then it turns out that the uh, by category of maps has its local HOM sets being discrete categories, so it's locally discrete. That's the case if you started off with B being the by category of relations, the maps of B would just bring you back the set, which is you know, this, as a two category that would be locally discrete. As I say, it's, in general, it's a misnomer. If you go up to the jazzier types of Cartesian by categories, including pro funkers, um, yeah, you don't get something that's locally discrete. What you actually get is that the maps will be locally groupoidal. So in other words, that every two cell between maps and prime categories is an invertible two cell. So it should be called what? Not a discrete Cartesian by category, but I don't know, groupoidal Cartesian by category. Hard to come up with a good name. I'm going to call it a Frobenius by category. So in a Frobenius kind of by category, I'm going to breeze through this kind of quickly. Uh, every object A is self-dual, and um, I'm just going to kind of breeze through. I mean, this is kind of a familiar fact. It's, it's basically saying, yeah, that, um, well, yeah, objects are self-dual means that you can turn relations around and talk about their opposites. So I'm going to just breeze through this. Uh, every one cell is mated to a, an adjoint one cell going in the opposite direction. If every object is mated to itself, then you can mate any uh, one cell to uh, a one cell between their duals in the opposite direction. And that will turn out to, it will turn out to give you R off in the classical case of sets and relations. 
this op operation formed by this mating procedure is, uh, is involutive, op op is the identity. It's conjugated on one cells, as you can quite clearly see going from here to here, but it's nice and codrine on two cells. Oops. And I'll just say that this op procedure it, it, uh, in the discrete or probenius bicategory case, op takes you from a left adjoint and takes it to you. It's right adjoint. So the right adjoint is F op. And the op of this brings you back to F. And uh, yeah, if alpha is a two cell now between maps, um, then, well, let's see, it'll have an, you know, a mate in the Australian sense. And then if you apply op to that mate, you would get actually the inverse between these two maps, which more or less proves that map B is, is that every two cell is inverted. So, I mean, the idea that the grand hope and dream, I'm calling it a modest goal. I think it might take me a little while, but uh, what I would like to do is describe the free Frobenius bicategory uh, generated by a relational signature in terms of these nice cobordism types of pictures. So just, as, just to get our feet wet in the problem, uh, might want to contemplate how you might describe in these cobordism -y ways the Frobenius bicategory, which is generated by just one sort S and no relations whatsoever. Just the free thing on one object. Well, yeah, the objects will be natural numbers. So that will correspond to Cartesian powers of the sort that you start with. You get a, a, basically a prop, but the one cells from M to N uh, will be, yeah, the oriented two cobordisms going from uh, N copies of a circle to N copies of a circle. So it's the, exactly the pictures I was describing. As for two cells, well, what we're going to be doing is sort of modifying the movie picture or the cobordism picture uh, for the thickened planar strip picture, but adapting this to the uh, more cobordism y picture for copies of S1. So I want to describe a picture, if I can, of what cobordisms between cobordisms look like. These will be the two cells. These will represent the two cells of the free Frobenius bicategory structure that I'm after here. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is imagine taking a two cobordism like this and embedding it inside a free space and taking the boundary circles and sewing on disks at the boundaries and you're going to get some kind of result which we call C bar. And then what I'm going to, when I, when I call the core of C will be the solid closed interior of that. And that's going to be a certain manifold with corners. I'm taking a guess here that the result here, the core does not really depend um, on which embedding you choose. You can put the same thing up to different morphism every time. So in other words, you take a cobordism that looks something like this and you sew on disks at all the boundary circles. So that's going to be all the shaded things here. And the core would just be the, in, the solid interior, which is inside here. That's the, that's the core. And then, um, yeah, continuing this, uh, I'm going to ask you to imagine a second two cobordism C prime, and imagine that um, yeah that you're embedding this also in R three and forming its core, and imagine that you that that core fits in some way inside the core of the first one C that you start with, in such a way that the sewn on boundary disks of the second one are interior to the boundary disks of the first. And then, you know, with this second core as a subset, imagine that you hollow out that, that second core by removing its interior. And then we're going to get a certain cobordism from C to C prime, which I'm going to call excising out stuff. So I'm going to call that an excisive cobordism. This is a simple picture of what I mean. So in this picture, we start off with a core of a simple cylinder representing the identity. And then we have a second cobordism, which is a cup followed by a cap. And we 
its core and we fit it inside the first core so that its boundary is interior to the outer boundary here. And then you hollow it out by removing its interior and you get this kind of sort of space that's left in between here after you've hollowed it out. And that is a cobordism now between this whole cylinder, oops, this whole cylinder and uh, this cobordism here. So you kind of map the identity into this configuration here. That's what I'm calling a size of cobordism. And that's the kind of direction that I posit um, is the correct direction to capture um, logical inferences. So you can go from identity to this, this is actually a unit or epsilon. So yes, uh, an excisive cobordism is a, um, a cobordism, which is sort of this middle part that you get in this way. You're definitely imposing a directionality here. So for example, if you start off with uh, this core here uh, contained inside the cuff and cap, there is no way that you're going to be able to fit the core of a cylinder inside that unit. So you're not going to be able to get from here, um, this, this unit back to the cylinder. You just can't do it. So there's a directionality being imposed. That directionality is important for logic. So uh, to wrap it all up, uh, my um, guess about what's going on here is that the two cells in the free Frobenius bicategory generated by a single sort correspond to diffeomorphism classes of these excisive cobordisms. I'm going to give another, another example here. So there exists. In this example, I'm going to observe that there are at least two morphisms, uh, two, two cells going from uh, this one cell to its cell. Clearly, the identity is one of them. But another one, well, I can indicate it like so. So, so this, this left hand diagram represents this composite. And then what I do is I kind of I kind of take this little bit of string here and I break it. That's really applying a unit for, for epsilon or the projection map. So this is one of the, the surgery moves and you kind of break the string. And then you see I have the word here slurp. I imagine that the, the co-unit identity for a cominoid allows you to kind of slurp this spaghetti strand and form a nice straight line. So you get the identity slurp from them. And then you apply the unit for delta being left adjoint to delta op, and get back to, to this thing. So, I mean, logically, I should say logically, uh, I mean, in, in proof of relevant context, I mean, the, uh, you don't distinguish between this composite and the identity, but you certainly would want to, in the jazzed up Cartesian bi category context, like cofunctors on groupoids, these will, this composite is definitely not the identity. And you can kind of see it uh, if you look at this cobordism. So now I'm kind of thickening this to a cobordism picture here. And so the original thing is this, uh, this kind of big configuration. And then you've kind of fitted inside that uh, a smaller copy, which is this. And I'm saying that there's no diffeomorphism which will take you from all this sort of uh, space in between those cobordisms. There's no way to um, diffeomorph that back to the identity. It's just, it's just kind of done. So that reflects the fact that you get uh, actually different two cells, at least according to the, the thesis that I'm advancing. So, I mean, there's lots of work to be done here, even just for the case of the free structure on a single sort. But um, having thought about this for some time, I have some confidence that this will work. And uh, just to indicate briefly what the situation is for more general relational signatures. If you're uh, not taking just a single sort, but if you're uh, taking a genuine relational signature, um, whose elements can be thought of as representing relations, then I want to represent those relations as um, actual two-dimensional disks that I've shaded right here. And what you do is you represent a one cell by kind of pasting together 
data that you get from delta and epsilon. And so this would be kind of um, sorts that would feed into the domain of an R here, and this would feed into the sort of you and these kind of, a, of attachings, which indicate the general nature of what um, one cells would look like in this topological picture. And then you have a notion of excisive cobordisms here too, uh, which I'm not gonna actually get to for lack of time. I went about 10 minutes over the hour, but in any case, the excisive cobordism picture carries over. And I have some mild confidence that this picture will pan out uh, in this context as well, I'll give you the free structure as well. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have to say about this today. Um, I'm sorry for going over time, but I hope this provided some food for thought for some of you. And I've enjoyed giving this presentation and I hope to meet with some of you either in person or over chat. And thank you very much for your attention. Say goodbye. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. say that there's been great appreciation for uh, string diagrams and their generalization. And mm -hmm. people really would like to see more in this direction of maker and Cartesian by categories to more understandable. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I hope some of that will be understandable. So yeah, um, the, there's been great appreciations for that. So yes, uh, if there's any question from the audience, uh, please write them in the Zulip channel. Okay, there's a question. So yeah, uh, yeah Pavel Sobosinski is asking, I have a question. So. So far, this is all about Pierce's alpha. Do you have any intuition about negation in this higher dimensional setting? In the higher dimensional setting, I have not given serious thought to this. Uh, so let me just say something. Uh, um, I think I heard alpha, uh, alpha referring just to the propositional portion of his existential graphs meaning that part corresponding to ordinary propositional logic or Boolean algebras. And what I've been doing today is sort of an updating of what he called, what Peirce called beta, which um, is really now we're bringing in the existential quantification. And so you know, he, as, as everybody knows, um, quantification uh, was developed at the end of the 1800s by Frege and also by, by Peirce. And I'm actually capturing that as well. But in any case, the question was. Um, uh, so wait, about... actually, he said he has a correction. He said, "Sorry, I meant beta without <laughs> negation." Yeah, yeah. So I've been doing beta without negation, and now the question is about adding in negation and how that would work. And it's a very interesting question. It would look complicated in terms of drawing pictures. So uh, what I've kind of given here is a very kind of pure, the very stripped down logic here, negation adds in um, more complexity that that purse really wrapped his hands around, his arms around. So I mean, there's this question, uh, the way that, that the purse represented negation um, is to say, in the simple case alpha, uh, he would represent expressions by a, a kind of code in which propositional variables are indicated by no, uh, by little points or nodes in the plane. And then if you want to negate that proposition, then you put a little circle around it, which is called a cephaline. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I'm wondering how I'm going to see about the visibility here. So, so I, I would like to maybe draw on the whiteboard that I have to Let's try. So now your picture is full screen. So we should be able to see it, but let's see. How's that? Can is it visible? We we should yeah. We see the blackboard uh, the whiteboard clearly. Let's see if you write on it. Maybe just make sure that you write thickly enough. Uh, I'm in my current little office at home, so let's give this a try. Let's see how legible this is. So. So there would be a little note in the plane right there. And that should be visible, yeah. This would be able, and let's call it P, for example. Uh, this would represent not P. But you know, as you know, I mean, not P is the same thing as P implies falsity. 
when you're uh, putting P in the antecedent of an implication, um, I mean, a lot of people like to think of that as um, that the hypothesis means that you're entering a hypothetical world. And so you're kind of entering a little snow globe in which P becomes a little hypothesis here. So this will be not P. Um, now, this will be not P and Q. I hope everybody can see that. I don't know what the visibility is like. I'm yeah, this should, should be fine. Okay, not P and Q. So, I mean, to indicate conjunction in, in the propositional portion, you juxtapose just like, you know, I've been describing this talk. And then, uh, if you want to say uh, not, not P and Q, you would surround that by another little circle, which uh, Peirce calls a sep line or short for separation line. So he's, uh, negation kind of separates or sequesters some expressions from others in sort of hypothetical world. But this would actually represent, uh, I think I want to sit a little bit backwards. When you analyze this in terms of Boolean logic, this actually gives you Q implies P. Is that visible here? It's visible, yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, so you know, by, by means of sub lines, he, he introduced negation. And the idea is that uh, he took his beta graphs as well and this surrounded certain portions of the beta diagrams, which look like string diagrams, more or less. He surrounded those by, by sep lines. And so presumably the idea is that uh, once you move to the three-dimensional picture with these cores and so on, you can presumably surround those configurations with uh, these sorts of, uh, <laughs> however you want to draw them, but some sorts of, uh, little shields, which will be like the set shields surrounding you know, those configurations. And then you can more or less follow, I think, you can more or less follow what Peirce does in terms of his, um, he sounds very quaint and old fashioned the way he writes, but uh, he talked about uh, the rules of inference in terms of using these set lines, which he calls iteration and deiteration and weakening, which we use to this day. Um, Anyway, I, I, I certainly have no doubts that this could be done. Um, it might be hard to draw. I found it difficult enough to get the ideas across in these in this in this format here. I'm I'm hoping that with with the advent of tools like Globular, we can begin doing deductions in this style very very quickly and efficiently. Uh, if I'd had more time, I was going to describe how you derive Fried's modular law or his allegories in terms of these co-borders and type pictures. But obviously, I, I didn't feel I had enough time for that. But anyway, thank you for the question. It's, it's a really interesting question. And something I've kind of thought about in the context of string diagrams for beta. Um, on Geraldine Brady's website, she's at the University of Chicago. Um, she has a paper which of ours, which never quite got published, but maybe we'll warm that up again and find a nicer venue. Anyway, thanks again. Great. Uh, thank you. So and a second question as Max New is answering, what is asking, what's the relationship between Cartesian by categories and pro arrow equipments? They seem very similar and Wood has worked in both. Is it just a matter of taste? Okay, so uh, I'm really, unfortunately, I'm not really expert about this kind of thing. So if I understand low arrow equipment, are those the same as framed by categories is what I would want to ask Max again. Are those the same as framed by categories? But in any case, um, yeah, I, I mean, this, I suspect this is a very nice question. I, I don't have a technical facility to give a proper answer to that, but it does raise a point that really, I mean, there's an argument to be made that, that bi-categories are not quite the right 
to use uh, to capture certain aspects of Cartesian bicategory theory. So one should use, in fact, double categories. Uh, so for example, you, want, you would like the maps to play the role of vertical arrows and the relations to play the role of horizontal arrows and then sort of capture the relationships between the two. In terms of a double category formalism, which would allow you some nice things that you can't quite capture for bi-categories. So for example, I mean, so I was saying before that if you look at the, the bi-category of maps in something like span, you're gonna get the category of sets back. If you look at maps um, in the bi, in the bi-category of profunctors between groupoids, you get the bi-category of groupoids back, but, when you take maps in or applied to the bi category of profunctors between general categories, you don't get cat back, but rather you get Cauchy complete categories, only Cauchy complete categories and functors between them. So you're missing out on a lot. And that, that's, that's a drawback of working strictly in the bi-categorical context when should really use double categories. And I understand that, um, that um, the pro era equipment formalism really takes place in that better setting of double categories. It should really be written down properly, I think. Uh, the the in-lab has some material on this, but I never got around to writing out the double category, the correct double category formulation. So, um, uh, uh, Max, uh, I know you just from your name. Um, thanks for your question. I would like to maybe pursue that a little bit more over the inform, perhaps. Maybe we could talk about this. Uh, while I'm here, uh, I can give people, the, the nice viewers, uh, my actual uh, home address that I typically use to talk with people. I'm going to write it out here on my whiteboard. So uh, if you'd like, you can write to this address. I'll copy it to Zulek just in case. Okay. Well, yeah, that's you already know it, Paolo. But for those in TV land, it's um, ah, topological dot musings. I got I guess the camera caught one. Topological dot musings. So yeah, uh, if any of anybody anybody watching wants to contact me, um, that's a good way to do it. The inform is also very welcome. Okay, so Max has thank you a lot and has helped to talk on the M forum, but now he has to leave. He's thanking you again. Thanks, thanks, Max. All right, next question. So we have that uh, Matt Cofaro is asking. Is there any relationship between Peirce's gamma model logic and the recent work in model homotopy type theory? Oh, no idea. <laughs> wow, what an interesting question. I don't write some of these questions down. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, so if you want so, these yeah. questions are are going to stay in the Zulip channel for further discussion, you can also answer yeah, I'll do a dedicated um, Stream for this. Um, yes, there is. I can yeah, get to that later if you want. So the question was about um, modal. So uh, the, the gamma part is, is what he's referring to. I didn't quite catch the. Yeah. So is there any relationship between versus gamma modal logic and the recent work yeah. in modal homotopy type theory? Yeah. Wish I could give an answer. I, I didn't quite catch the name of the the, the asker. Oh yeah, Matt Kufaro. M A T T C U F F A R O. Okay, thanks, Matt. Yeah, um, sounds like an interesting question. Uh, gamma was so ill-developed in Peirce's time, and it's, it's really hard to figure out what he was on about. Uh, 
so the story, as I understand it, is that uh, Purse, uh, Purse basically died poverty stricken, alone in a cold farmhouse in Pennsylvania. So he was never one who was very successful academically. His big buddy was William James. So William James got him to come to Harvard to give lectures on his existential graphs. But uh, I, I don't know, uh, Per seems to be somebody who is an absolute genius, but, but not uh, too good with the, practical, the practicalities of life. So at any rate, what happened was is, uh, when he died, uh, it was arranged that all of his papers and possessions would be, get transferred to Harvard. And so uh, it, it fell to somebody named Clarence Lewis to, uh, as a young man to sort out the tens of thousands of little scraps of paper and pages and dirty notebooks or whatever and try to instill some sort of semblance of order into the whole thing. And so uh, it was a massive project which resulted in the collected papers of, of Charles Sanders Peirce. And so my own feeling, which uh, it's, it's very tentative, I can't really back it up that well, but my own feeling is that um, modal logic was sort of uh, a fashionable topic in the 1930s when Clarence Lewis was trying to deal with all this and that uh, somehow the interpretation of gamma in terms of modal logic, while undeniable, uh, was maybe uh, in the ascendant to the degree that other aspects of gamma might have been overlooked. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of bending your ear a little bit right now, but my own feeling is that Peirce um, was going beyond first order logic to higher order logic. You can get a sense of this by looking at certain passages where he's talking about gamma. But that thread seems not to have been picked up by the modal logicians at Harvard or since then. So, I mean, I just have a speculation that there was kind of a proto, I wouldn't say topos theory, but I would say a proto power allegory theme taking place within gamma, which um, if I ever got back some pages that I lent to somebody, I could back up to some small degree. But, um, but I, I think there's, there's a lot to be mined in gamma. You know, it's not particularly public. I, mean, I, I found some old, old pages of his in the archives at UChicago, and those do not appear in his collected papers. So um, you know, like what um, just Xeroxed copies of sheets in Purse's handwriting. So, uh, I first got some of these notions. Anyway, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I kind of went off on a tangent here. I'm not really addressing the question, but uh, I find Purse interesting. So I just thought I'd throw that out there for you. Thank you. And by the way, Paul Tawaczynski is, ask, is thanking you for the previous answer. So we have another oh. question uh, by uh, Remy Tujeras. He's asking, so it looks like concatenations of cobordisms, as in Russian dolls. Could there be an operat structure hidden where the inputs would be all the one paths like going down, so to say, inside the, inside the three cobordisms? Yeah. And the composition could be insertions of cobordisms inside the one paths. Yeah, I think very much so. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely operatic aspects to, uh, to these geometries. Uh, yeah, I think that's very much along the right track. Uh, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you, know, you can kind of think of, you know, al already at the at the one cell level, you can already think of the uh, the cobordisms, the two dimensional cobordisms as uh, the morphisms of a prop, which is, you know, and as you know, that uh, props are very closely related to operads. So I mean, there's definitely this kind of flavor going on. Um, it would be nice if we could really get the technology up and going so that I could actually um, converse with people. Uh, at a whiteboard so that I am sh quite sure about the pictures that you have in mind, but um, my, my gut reaction is this sounds definitely on the right track and, uh, and uh, I would encourage anybody to pursue that connection. So he's actually maybe saying something like, so the idea would be to grow the one path into a tube and this tube could take any positive genus cobordism that fits in a large sense inside this tube. 
Yeah. Yeah. So there's a discussion yeah, 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 yeah. going on between uh, Rami and Samuel Tanka on the on the Zulip channel. Maybe later you can join it and discuss the details. I, I, I'm already overwhelmed by the Zulip business. I mean, uh, the inbox just fills up really quickly. But um, yeah, um, if if there's a way of pinging me at my Gmail address, uh, I you know I'd be happy to jump in. Sure. So, yeah. so maybe contact him at uh, the Gmail address yeah. is written there. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's what seems to be the last question. Um, so, where did it go, sorry. Yeah, so John Miller is asking, is the separation related to separation logic? Hmm. And well, I, somebody's answering I, no, but the question is still there. I don't know what separation logic is. I see. Well, apparently there's going to be a, a talk on it in the UCR seminar. I also don't oh, know what it is. Okay. Who's the next seminar? So yeah, okay. Any more questions? Any more questions? Uh, please ask in the Zulip channel. Let's wait for a little bit because there may be some buffer. In the meantime, you've received lots of clap emojis. <laughs> so I think people appreciate your talk a lot. Um, so the, the UCR seminar, who's, who will be giving that talk on separation logic? I think so. So I don't have the schedule right now. Oh, okay. I just uh, wanted to name a yeah, I can look the, the discussion about the, the operators is, uh, is going on, but I think uh, we should move that uh, offline. So you can find it there, or you can contact. Uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of contact. students who probably need to get in touch with me. I'm giving a test today uh, remotely. So <laughs> I was afraid that, that, that my computer would be dinging like mad, but I, I was not cognizant of too much of that as I was speaking. But I should probably get off the computer. But, but thank you again, Paolo, for your able technical assistance. And I'd like to renew my thanks to David Spirak for inviting me to give a talk in the MIT seminar. I wish I could have done it there in Boston, but uh, yeah. someday. Well, for now, thank you for the great talk. Somebody, so uh, Paul Andre Melies, uh, one last question, if you still have time. Yeah. Uh, so let's say yes go ahead so it says there's a nice relationship between Frobenius monoids and star autonomous categories mm -hmm. uh, so there's do you see appearing it in your work Yeah, um, hmm. yeah, so yeah, I, I need, I need to, I need to think about that. So I, the, the um, what is it? It's something like, well, I, no, I'm, I'm just sort of bandying about the, the buzzwords here. So I need to think about it properly though. But if I recall the buzzwords correctly, it's something like a star autonomous category is essentially equivalent to a pseudo frobenius monoid in the bio category of photons and something like that and um, yeah i mean uh, yeah I, i'd, I'd want to think a little bit so that i'm not making level slips but let me let me write down um so uh, the, the, it was sort of an open-ended question if I um, caught it. Uh, it. It just sounded, do I see star autonomous categories sort of cropping up in, in the types of things I'm studying? And, you know, I guess, you know, in one sense, there's a really sort of stupid, facile 
response to that, and that's that um, Boolean algebras, <laughs> I feel stupid saying this, but bo Boolean algebras are already start autonomous categories. So I mean, they, they already popped up at the very lowest levels, but I think he's asking about something else. Uh, I wish I could get a better answer to, to this, but it was an open-ended question. It's just, you know, I'll take it as food for thought about exploring the connections between star autonomous categories and, uh, and these um, categorified Frobenius algebras, which they are. I, I need to think about it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so yes, yeah, some, some, some of the discussion is going on in the Zolip channel. So if you want, uh, also in the next days, I can uh, also help you with that. Okay. Because I think it's really a, it's really a great resource for like offline discussions that uh, the talks start. By the way, thanks to Christy yeah. Williams for starting this. I think it's a really great idea. Uh, so yeah. Oh, I, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, he was the one who spearheaded this. Yeah, yeah. I met him last summer in Scotland. And, uh, yeah, uh, good on him for doing this. Uh, I, so, I think it was him. I hope I'm not giving credit to the wrong person. Yeah, yeah. He but, the, the, yeah. Driving forces behind. Yeah, thank you, Christian, for uh, this. So, if you ever, uh, thank you, Christian, for setting this up, the Zula. Um, seems to be made quite a splash already. So, so Paul and Remelius is thanking you for the talk, too. Oh. And, uh, yeah. Paul and Remelius. Oh, oh. Oh, I, I've never had the pleasure of meeting, but appreciate it. Thank you very much. Oh, he's the one that asked the last question. Oh, 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 oh okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's really great that we can do this, and we, we can meet a lot of people that we've only heard of so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be any more questions, uh, so I think we can move this offline. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very nice and had very nice drawings that hopefully have clarified things to a lot of people. And, uh, yeah, so thanks on behalf of everything. So, see you guys on the Zillip channel then, and thank you all for coming. I think, uh, yeah, bye, and bye to everyone. See you there.